How's everybody doing today? It's 10 a.m. and you're here. I, I thank you very much. I, I'm barely here, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll, 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 we'll vote for this in a second. So I'm Dave. Um, I'm the creator of the Social Engineer Toolkit. I'm on the Social Engineer Podcast. Um, I'm a penetration tester and a bunch of other things, but most importantly, you know, what I get to do a lot of nowadays is everything from exploit research to penetration testing to um, social engineering attacks and different things that work and don't work. And the reason why I came up with this initial topic is I find it is, it's actually getting increasingly harder to get into companies from the outside. You know, uh, our footprints are shrinking. Um, things like SQL injection you may still see every once in a while if you're not really mature on that side of the house. Um, so from an application security perspective, things are getting a little bit better. Now, obviously, if they're just slapping WAPs in place and stuff like that, they're easy to circumvent, bypass, and get around. But, I mean, truthfully, it's extremely easy right now to get in through the social engineering aspect. And we'll talk a little bit about different scenarios that work and don't work. But what I wanted to show you today is, is different scenarios and situations that I've been a part of, that I've done social engineering attacks that have worked very well, um, and different techniques that you can use to use it. As part of that, I'll be demoing the social engineer toolkit as I normally do, um, my baby. So I actually just did a commit as we were getting things ready, so. Um, <laughs> I make like six to 10 updates a week, um, so I apologize for that. But um, I'm also the founder of DerbyCon, and um, I'm on the Backtrack development team, and the ExploitDB development team, and a couple of other things, so I get to uh, do some fun, interesting, fun stuff. So social engineering is nothing new, right? It's been around for a number of years, since the dawn of man, man when cavemen were hitting people over the heads with, their, with the women. Anyways, it's early. Um, <laughs> it happened, right? I mean, it's proof. I mean, anyways. Um, I wasn't saying that. In, anyways, so uh, I'm just going to keep digging myself out of this hole here. <laughs> there's two. There's, there's three. We're okay. <laughs> no, but I mean, social engineering has been around for a number of years, um, specifically, too, and obviously on the technology side. I think, you know, um, in the early 80s, uh, mid 90s, obviously with Kevin Mitnick and a bunch of other things, social engineering was a big topic of, of interest. And then it kind of died off when we started getting to the network attacks, the operating system attacks, the web application attacks, and really have started to take a lot of focus again with technology because, you know, instead of spending weeks and weeks and weeks finding a zero day, oh my God, it's Egypt, I love you. What's that, man? Sorry. Um, <laughs> instead of spending weeks and weeks and weeks finding a zero day, um, or hoping that they have a specific you know, piece of technology that you can go and exploit, just calling them up on the phone or sending them something that's crafted is a lot less intensive and much more successful. Um, I'll be showing you some techniques that are really easy to get around a lot of the preventative technologies, such as like antivirus and HIPs and all those other things. I'll show you really fast and easy ways to get around those, your own custom payloads that you can use uh, to do that. But uh, most importantly, you're really focusing on the human element. And so, you know, coupling technology with the social engineering or the spear phishing side of the house is really what we're going to be going through today. So before we do that, I like to teach people some basic concepts of social engineering. If you've seen this, this is the only the part I've ever reused is this part here. Um, but I'm going to teach you a little bit about social engineering and how to come off appropriately uh, when you actually go and do your social engineer attack. Because there's certain things that will raise suspicious um, type, type behaviors inside of us if we're doing things on the phone calls or for sending spear fishes out, or we're doing this in person. A lot of the ones that I get to do nowadays too are also in person, so I'm trying to get into um, data centers, or I'm trying to get into actual you know, high security facilities, or government contracts, or things like that, so I'm trying to break into different places. So you have to have a level of suspicion, or a level of, of uh, acceptance and trust before you can actually get into those type of places, and so we'll be covering that. But again, it's all about comfort and, and trust and believability. And why it's, in why it's effective is inherently as human beings, we trust people, right? I, right now, I trust every single one of you, maybe minus like one or two, um, because you haven't done anything to, to violate that trust. We have a common courtesy as Americans, as humans, as different things. I mean, we don't have that same level of trust with a lion that we see running through the woods, right? Or a big ape that's gonna sit there and beat us up and kill us and right in front of us because you know we don't have that trust factor with them. But other humans, we do. So when I turn my back to you guys, I don't feel like I'm going to get beat up or shanked or, you know, a little, you know, wooden bat to the knee or anything like that because I trust you until you violate that trust. And so until you violate or come off in some sort of negative fashion, you already have rapport with somebody before you even talk to them. But there's certain things that can happen to instantly take that away that you might not even be aware of. So let's talk a little about understanding human behavior. 
if you look at this guy, and he's a good looking dude, and I'm not saying that in a weird way. Um, <laughs> I always got to preface that because every time I get called out, like, you see, he's a good looking dude. I'm like, okay, he's a good looking guy, right? And, you know, I, whatever. So, <laughs> all right, so yeah, I'm just digging deeper. Um, so you have this guy here, okay, and he looks, he looks like a good guy, right? But why does he look like a good guy? What are some facial features with him that, that makes him impersonable or somebody that we would trust right away without even talking to him? Those teeth, man. Teeth, white teeth, absolutely. He's cleanly, he's, you know, he's got some really nice white teeth. He looks good. Um, if you notice his dimple structure, he's smiling, it's genuine. So he's actually smiling at you. And you know, notice his facial features here. He's squinting in the eyes, which is kind of a form of compassion or you know, submission in a way. So hey, you know, I'm compassionate towards what I'm talking to or who I'm talking to. Notice his forehead. A lot of times squinting your, or raising your eyes like this and squinting your, your little um, fold here with your, your head can be a sign of um, tension. Notice this is flat. You notice his hair, good looking hair. He's a good looking guy, right? There's nothing that would that would prevent this person from not being trustworthy. And this came up to us and said, hey, I'm going to beat you up. Me smiling, you know, like, hey, I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> then we might have a little reserve, like, well, that's kind of weird. I don't know if I like him or not, but, you know. But what I do want to say is I'm going to, we're going to play a little game. It's called Trust or Don't Trust. And this game, you have to be honest with. And guys, don't be, like, all, all like, manly and macho. Like, no, that's a dude. I wouldn't trust him. You know, that's just a guy. We don't trust guys. Be serious with this because... You know, you'll see different features that actually show signs of distrust or not trusting. So how about this guy? Do we trust or not trust? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Never trust someone with facial hair. Okay. All right. It's good to know. Good to know. This guy's got a beard. I say, he's got a beard. So. Don't trust Brian. Don't trust Brian. Half smile. Half smile. Okay. Hair gel. Hair gel. Hair gel is a sure indicator that he's a bad guy. <laughs> no, there actually is one key thing here that actually makes him come off as not trustworthy, but in most cases, we're going to trust him until he violates that trust. All right? The thing that he's doing is he's off-center. He's coming to you at a slant, which is somewhat of a standoffish as far as human behavior goes, or you know, hands in pocket, or kind of like this when I'm talking to you, slouched over. It does give a, a negative impression, but there's nothing that he's doing right now that would give us a negative impression of not to trust. You know, he's got... Decent looking teeth, he does have facial hair, which I guess is a negative now. Um, hair gel, which is a negative. Um, that could just be natural. It's moose. <laughs> That's moose. Could be moose. Man, Man. <laughs> he's probably got five or six different products, to be honest with you. <laughs> so we trust him. All right? What about this guy? Oh, give me a break. It's every IT guy in here right now. <laughs> That is, yeah, that, is, that is every single IT guy that we know. Um, but he is doing something that does come standoffish, right? He's got his hands in his pockets, right? Not interested, you know, don't have any type of um, care for what I'm doing type of thing, or hey, I'm too cool for school, that type of thing. So this guy could come off as possibly being a little bit abrasive, but in most cases, that's every single IT guy we know, so we trust him. Uh, this guy. <laughs> Hell no, he's a sales guy. He is a sales guy. And we do not trust those guys because they are snakes. <laughs> sales guys, we do not trust. So for sales guys, um, it's interesting. So when they first come off to you, they call you up on the phone, and who's ever got a call from a sales guy before? <laughs> who's ever gotten 10 in one day before? Yeah. yeah. One of my guys uh, did a joke at uh, uh, Black Hat for me. And I was, when I was the CSO of uh, Fortune 1000 company, um, they basically took my badge, and, and I didn't go to Black Hat. I just gave it to one of my guys. I, I'm not supposed to say that, but um, he basically went around and scanned each one of the, the booths with my badge. They had my email address and phone numbers, and I literally had 60 calls a day. I mean, it was ridiculous. But we don't trust those people because of that, right? We feel like we're getting sold something that we don't necessarily want or that we know we're doing better, that we don't need someone else to come and help us until they really fix that trust, right? They, they establish a relationship with you. They take you out to a party. They take you to Morton's and buy you a nice steak, and then they give you a 90% discount on something that costs them ten dollars, but they're selling it to you for five million dollars, and they're giving you a discount on that, you know, for four million dollars. So, we don't trust salespeople until they establish that relationship with us. So we don't trust him off the bat, but we could eventually someday. But what's actually some facial features with this guy that we don't trust? Anybody, anybody, can anybody see it? Raised eyebrows. Raised eyebrows. Very good. He's not genuine in what he's trying to do. He's like, hey, you need to buy this, huh? Right? <laughs> Notice his smile. 
not a genuine smile. Right? He's kind of like, eh, whatever. And obviously, he's pointing at something in, in, in a perception to try to sell something. So we don't trust this guy. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's that? That's not me as a baby. <laughs> Pretty close, though. Hell yeah, we, we trust this kid, right? Because kids have an um, uncanny knack to not do wrong, in our opinion, right? Especially kids like this. They don't have a filter to do things that are right or wrong. So we automatically trust this kid. Which, by the way, if you have kids, the best way to social engineer your wife is a kid. No offense, but you need a TV or a new car or things like that, you can totally use your kid for that and make it feel guilty. Right? What? I'm not saying from experience, I'm saying you can do it, all right? All right, so the next one, um, ladies, if you couldn't, if, if you wouldn't mind not saying anything real quick, this is this is a, a, a guy sample size um, type type thing. Trust or don't trust? Don't Hell yeah, you trust. It's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> it is a girl. Ladies, if you don't know this right now, you have the best uncanny social engineering abilities in this world. Okay, so we trust. All right. Of course you trust. <laughs> Not only do you trust, but you will give her everything, your wallet, your car keys, <laughs> social security number, whatever you want you got from this chick right here, okay? You trust. How about this? That is a picture of your wife. <laughs> Not not really your wife. I mean, I'm just saying that is that is everyone's wife right now. Especially while you're here at this conference. <laughs> So obviously, you, you know, you kind of trust, but you, uh, you, you trust a little bit, okay? All right, this guy? <laughs> what, what, what would be an indicator of why we wouldn't trust him? This is a very simple one, right? Because he's, he's coming at you angry. He's coming at you as, as possibly abrasive. And so as humans, we don't like conflict. Sorry. Good. We don't like conflict. We're not conflict type people. So this one we would don't we would instantly not trust. How about this guy? Why not? Tattoos, right? Tattoos in, in our society is a form of, hey, I'm a badass, right? And so you don't want to go talk to a badass because you might have a confrontation with this person. I apologize for the language there. I don't have a filter. <laughs> so we don't trust. <laughs> So probabilities, um, women, you have a 90% chance of being successful in a social engineer. Just by doing nothing, just by being a woman. That's, that's, that's that. So you being on the phone talking to a man, you have a 90% chance of being successful. Because in our culture, we don't perceive women as being you know, deceitful, lying, or cheating, or stealing. And I know that's like, never mind. So <laughs> now if you, throw, if you throw a southern accent or a British accent on top of that, your, your chances of social engineering go up 4%. Just by throwing up a, a southern accent or by throwing up any type of British accent. And for some reason, southern accents have uh, a much more higher success rate and probability than British accents do, but British accents sound just as awesome too. So if you want my wallet, you can have it. <laughs> kids have a 97% likelihood chance of being successful in social engineering because they're kids. We don't expect them to lie to us, right? In general, if you just don't do anything with social engineering, you like just hey, I'm going to go call this company and, and figure things out. You have about an 84% chance of being successful. So pretty high success probability rate of going after a company without knowing anything. And the reason being is in social engineering, your pretext is everything. And your pretext is basically your attack, what you're going to, your fantasy that you're going to create, okay? And so when you're doing your pretext, if you actually do enough, you know, um, reconnaissance and understanding the corporation and understanding who you're going to target, you have a high probability rate of being successful. Now, this actually goes down significantly in, in different types of situations, which we'll talk about in a second. But you need to be convincing. Um, you have to develop an understanding for the company you're targeting. That is so key. Making it look believable and, and, and uh, making it look real. Things that will stop you. Before we actually go into different attacks that I've used that have been very successful, small companies are rough, especially if you're trying to impersonate somebody inside of the company because they all know each other, right? And also, small companies have a pretty tight relationship with most people. If they have a dedicated person to security, they usually have a pretty tight relationship with those people as a company. So small, and I say small, I say about 500 or less, 1,000 or less is probably the, the tipping point for that. So a lot harder to get into companies that are smaller because of that relationship aspect. Um, companies that focus on heavy education awareness is significantly much more challenging to get into than companies that don't. 
And I can tell you that for a fact. I know there was um, a little bit of a debate on the Twitter universe, and I think it was a Computer World article or whatever, but I think Dave, Dave Attell from Immunity um, said that, you know, don't invest in your education awareness, invest in your preventative controls around, you know, your users versus actually educating them. And I fundamentally disagree on that topic because I've seen it, right? I've seen companies that actually invest in educating their employees, and it's significantly much more challenging to get them. Now, do I eventually get one? Yeah, probably, but it's significantly harder. And by the time I get there, at least everybody's aware of what's going on, and they're trying to respond to that incident. So companies that actually invest in education awareness have a much higher likelihood of, of being stopped or having the attack stop. So scenario one, I was doing a penetration test for a company and social engineering was within scope. Real, real light footprint on the external presence. Uh, talking, you know, handful of web servers. Uh, one was third party host. Their main website was third party hosted. The other were like completely static, you know, websites. Nothing major, no SQL injection or RFI LFIs or file uploads or anything like that that I would typically use to compromise the, the application layer. No network layer type stuff. They had um, their, their um, uh, mail was outsourced, and they only allowed 25 to that, to that uh, outsource provider. So, you know, 25 DNS, nothing was basically available from the outside. So a real small footprint, but a relatively large company. It was really nice to see. Luckily, social engineering was, was in play. So what I had to figure out is I'm not going to get in through the external perimeter. How am I going to get in in another way? And Am I going to use phone calls? Am I going to use impersonating somebody getting into the company, like through you know, the front door? Or am I going to go do some sort of targeted spear phishing attack? So I started looking at my different avenues. And the first phase of any type of good attack through social engineering is the planning phase. Really trying to understand your target, using open source intelligence, finding information on there. Um, there's one thing that I, I can highly recommend if you want some real quick hit information to go after people, is Jigsaw. Has anybody here used Jigsaw before? Has anybody used the, the new tool in Backtrack Jigsaw? Um, from one of the dudes from Akio, I think wrote it. Oh my God, seriously guys, this is one of the best things ever. Let me show you, super fast. Make sure you update it from the latest Git, Git repositories because if you don't, um, there's some bugs with the cookies. This is, um, anybody here from Jigsaw by the way? <laughs> seriously? Okay, I'm just checking. So there's a feature I guess you can use in Jigsaw. Um, feature. And unfortunately, it's code in Ruby. Just kidding. I know. I was just, I was just joking. <laughs> I was just kidding, man. Um, so let's do, um, we're going to do a search for someone named a company. What's that? Trusted sec. I don't think it's going to find trusted sec. Hyatt? Let's do Hyatt. So you do a search for Hyatt, and what happens is it will return um, the different um, businesses that are set up as Hyatt. So let's go look at what has the most employee base in it. So if we go up here, we can see that the Hyatt Hotel Corporation has 3,458 employees that it has records for, all right, email addresses and everything. So what you need is you gotta get the Jigsaw ID, which is uh, 209355. Can't remember the syntax here. And then we're gonna give it at the ID What's going to happen is it's going to actually put everything into different fields for us. Notice here, it'll actually tell you which domain names are registered to the highest, so you can select which one you want to. So we'll select Hyatt.com, which is number three. Notice here, it's actually pulling the different departments out, sales department, everything else. I found 871 records just in the sales department. So if I'm going to start targeting people in the sales department, which is always, by, always, by the way, really good, especially from a, a B2P or B2B type, type situation. If you're coming in as someone that wants to buy something from them or spend money with them, they're usually more keen to do anything that you want to. And this is gonna take a little while because it's basically gonna extract, uh, how, how many was, 3,000 some, some email addresses. But you're basically gonna be able to enumerate the whole company, all of their email addresses that you can go and target for a spearfish. So now you have all of their, their email addresses and usernames um, that you can go start targeting, which is really slick. So, so Jigsaw um, is an actual company. You pay for some crazy, like I think if you want like 500 records, it's like 500 bucks um, to get the records. And so it's basically like a social media site that has harvested cards from all over the world and you know, used other different means of getting um, email addresses through um, like uh, different websites that sell them back and forth, like maybe like a Facebook or something that sells email addresses or something like that that sells something. Maybe they don't, but I don't know. Um, but so it's basically a collection of, of whatever they've been able to scrape off the internet for those different companies. And it's highly accurate, it's really weird. Um, 
like I'll get bounce backs every once in a while, but it's it's I would say out of the email address list, I probably have about a 90% clip of being successful um, on those email addresses. So it's usually pretty cool. But you notice it's still extracting. I mean, I got 113 records in engineering and research, which if I'm going after intellectual property or want to target the company, hit them where they, they hurt, I'm going to go after the research and development side of the house, or the engineering side. Engineers are awesome. If I'm going after administrative overrides, I might target the IT or information security team. You know, so you had the different groups. Human resources is a great one. Uh, support department's also a really great one because they always want to support people. Uh, marketing's also really good. Uh, marketing opportunities. Um, one of my favorite ones that I did on the marketing side is I claimed to be a reporter from uh, Fox News. And uh, we said, hey, I want to have, have your, your uh, company do a, a key, uh, key piece in one of our, our O'Reilly show. I think it was like a Bill O'Reilly show or something like that. And so um, I don't know which one it was. I don't remember. But anyways, um, the people jumped all over. And I had all the executives in on this and had them on conference calls. And like we were talking about scheduling and stuff like that. And so through there, I had them going to websites and downloading malware and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. It was awesome. <laughs> but, but think about what I did there, though. That specific instance, I played so much on human emotion and excitement. Like, hey, if you want a key spot on Fox News to, to, to have your company basically portrayed in a very positive manner because of what you're doing here, and I'll find like, some stupid reason. Like, like, say, for example, the Hyatt. I find out that they're using like, green efficiency in energy with their towels. Like, oh my God, you guys are using, you guys are the best green efficiency people in the world. We want to highlight that on Fox News. They're like, oh my God, you really? Seriously? Okay, let me get all the executives on, on play and then they get on the phone call and you have them download malware. <laughs> and by the way, it is really mean. It is, it is, it is really mean. <laughs> it is really mean. It's not cool at all. It's definitely not cool. So with this company, um, again, it was, it was a 50-year anniversary, so they had just gone through their 50-year anniversary, which is which was key to me because um, people pride themselves on their heritage of their company and what they do and their products and all that good stuff, and you probably had people there that had been there for 50 years. Um, so if you start looking at the culture of this company, the culture is very family-oriented. You have people that have been there for a number of years. You know, you look at the whole um, mission statement, it's all about family and, you know, careers and things like that. So the company itself is very much that family feel type, right? So there's a couple of things I started thinking about when I'm gonna go and attack this company. And the first thing is um, I pulled all their information from, uh, is everybody familiar with FOCA? FOCA's a great tool um, that'll crawl websites and extract all the metadata um, off of like PDF files and Word documents and stuff like that. And from there you can grab user IDs, version numbers of like Word, PDF, things like that. But it's really good to automate a lot of that and pull it back and see all the metadata and scrape through it. Um, so I use FOCA and Jigsaw to, to grab a lot of information out and started to really start to look at what I'm going to profile. Now, I started, I started to think about what I would fall for in this type of company. I emerged myself into this company as an employee, as someone that has been there for a long time, as someone that respects my company and trusts them. Not, not everybody's going to have the same feeling, but based on what I can tell from the outside and people's tenure there, especially looking at LinkedIn, like if you look at LinkedIn and see how long they've been at the company, a lot of them have been there for a long time, I know that I, I need to do something that's going to excite them emotionally. And playing on emotion is the key in social engineering, especially in spear phishing. Okay? So the pretext that we came up with, and this may sound really lame, and this is really mean too, um, the company had a 50-year-old anniversary. So what I did is I started looking at um, how they did their public relations, and I found their key person in the public relations site, a girl by the name of Jennifer. I made that up. It's not really Jennifer, so, so you can't like, trace it back somehow. Um, so Jennifer... Uh, was their main public relations person. And she handled all of the corporate communications for the entire company. So I started looking at Jennifer, and I started sending her some emails back and forth, claiming to be somebody of, um, of uh, media instance. Uh, I think I claimed to be the Wall Street Journal at this time. And she started sending me emails back, because I wanted to see the format of her emails. That's all. So then I stopped. I, you know, once she sent me an email back, I ignored it. And I basically started formatting my email to look like theirs. And I made a press release that looked just like theirs as well, that they would normally blast out to the whole world. And what I said is, you know, as part of, you know, being a family heritage type company, as part of being, you know, the best in what we do, uh, we're, you know, we're giving 50 free iPhones to our, our associate population, our employee population, because they're so great to us. And I know that sounds really evil, and it's really effed up, I, I do agree. Um, but, you know, the first 50 people that go to this site and register will get a free iPhone delivered within three to five business days. And so 
when you go to this website, obviously it's malicious and it hacks the heck out of you and we steal credentials and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but at the same time, I registered a domain name that looked just like theirs in every way, shape, or form. It had a couple of letters off, like for example, company name PR.com is a good one. Um, you know, different things that you can do to kind of, you know, trace that name back a bit. So we had this, this pretext built, but again, we had to make it believable. Working links, um, we just cloned the whole website. Uh, registered domain names. <laughs> So again, I found some press releases um, with the, the person Jennifer in it and really cloned a lot of that. So, um, so some caution here. When I'm doing spear phishing attacks, I don't like to send it out to everybody right away. I like to kind of do it in phases and waves. Uh, and reason being is if I need to go after some sort of IP, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, source code or um, process that makes the company special, I'll target engineers or I'll target sales folks and things like that initially. Um, so in this case, I stayed away from the IT guys because I knew that they probably wouldn't fall for something like this because they would be supporting these devices. I stayed away from executives because they probably know that they're not going to give away 50 iPhones to their employee population. Um, and I stayed away from anything human, human resources related and I stayed away from anything that was really, um, that might have an idea of what's really going on. So I really focused on uh, the sales and engineers and others that would actually fall for this. Um, stay away from public relations and executives again. So what I ended up scraping was about 37 people that I targeted. Um, and the email, again, was crafted from a press release perspective. So it looked just like the standard press releases that they're going to use, the headers, the logos, everything. Did you spell it correctly? I did spell it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had, I've had one customer that uh, is like, listen, this is really ridiculous. Uh, can you just put a whole bunch of typos in here? Because there's no way we're going to even be able to do that. And I still own them all the way. But, um, but launching an attack. When I do these attacks, the, the problem that I have doing these, now there's, there's certain techniques that you can do to enumerate a lot of the information that they have behind the scenes, like maybe sending them a couple things and it starts to profile their computer or have them go to a website that actually uh, maps their infrastructure to see if you may have a vulnerable exploit in Java or PDFs or otherwise. But what I like doing um, is not using an exploit at all anymore for this type of attack. Um, obviously I use exploits in other avenues, but in this side of the house, I don't know what they necessarily have, but I know that they have Java. I know. They have Java, unfortunately. They have Java. And so I can target them and attack Java and get access to them in a way that, that isn't going to actually use any type of exploit whatsoever. Okay? And that's usually using the Java applet. And so with the Java applet, um, I'll show you an example here in a second, which is my favorite attack vector in the Social Engineer Toolkit because it's always effective. Um, it circumvents pretty much any protect protection mechanism they have out there, antivirus, HIPs, things like that. And the way that it does it is, is a couple of different methods. The first is when the applet pops up, um, you can either sign or not sign. It doesn't actually, statistically, it doesn't even make a difference. So like if you have that big warning message that says this is an unknown application, you shouldn't trust it, it versus a code signing certificate that actually has it, has it published, the success ratios are exactly the same. So there's no difference whatsoever, um, which I found astonishing. I'm like, hey, I spent $400 on this code signing cert because I wanted to be more believable. And then I found out that it doesn't even make a difference. So anyways. Um, so I use that method, so when they actually click on it, what happens is, um, thank gosh for moving off of Windows XP, because Windows 7 for me as an attacker is so much better, um, <laughs> because of PowerShell. PowerShell by far is my, the, my favorite post-exploitation thing in the world. Like PowerShell to me is the holy grail of everything that there is for me to be able to attack. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think PowerShell is an amazing, amazing leap forward as far as uh, the Microsoft operating system given the features and functionalities. And obviously this is post-compromise type stuff. But what I can do with PowerShell that I can't do anywhere else, specifically through Java because of sandbox and as I figure out an exploit to break out of, out of sandboxing, is I have direct access to the memory through PowerShell. So with PowerShell I can inject straight up shell code straight into memory without ever touching disk, not having to drop anything on the operating system, and PowerShell is installed by default and cannot be removed from Windows 7. Perfect. So I know it's there, right? So when I can inject straight into memory, I know that I have the ability to attack that platform, and I know things like whitelisting and blacklisting, PowerShell has to be whitelisted because it's part of the operating system. So you can't have it, you know, blacklisted, or things like the help menus don't work, or you know, certain functionality that you would have in, in an operating system. It's embedded in the core of it, so you don't have that features and functionality to remove it. So it does that. And then if that fails, it actually does a binary dropper on the system that um, shoots shellcode straight into memory. So when you actually look at the executable, it doesn't do anything. 
So if you double click it or you have something like a virtualization technology that looks to see if there's any malicious stuff going on, it doesn't do anything. Nothing. Just exits. Double click it, it exits. But if you give it enough weird things to it, it actually goes and shoots stuff into, into memory and then it sends it back out and shoots you that, that shell. So it does two methods. So let's look at the attack and making it believable. So you notice here, by the way, here's all the Hyatt email addresses. And what, what? Still going. Still going. Here, let me just let me scroll back up here. Still going. Still going. So that's all the email addresses that, that they have in their, but you can see the different groups, you know, sales manager, sales department, sales executive, director of sales, receptionist of sales. These are all sales. Let me go down here. Finance and administration, human resources, president, I'm sure. I mean, you can you know, hit whatever you want to with it. It's good stuff. Very powerful. Laundry manager. <laughs> Laundry manager. <laughs> so now that we're in the set, this is the toolkit. If you haven't used it, uh, definitely check it out. Um, it's pretty robust in features and functionality, and it hooks very well into the Metasploit framework from a post-exploitation standpoint and browser exploits. Um, like, obviously, the, the king of all post-exploitation is Meterpreter. And so it definitely hooks into Meterpreter to use that as a, a, a stable payload. And so we do the social engineer attacks. We're going to go to the website attack vector. And what's cool here is you can do a thing called multi-attack, which um, say one of your methods of attack fails, like i.e. the, the um, Java app, but it fails. You still want other ancillary methods to be able to collect information from them if they don't believe it. Uh, like for example, um, you can do what's called the Java repeater, which every time they hit cancel, it pops right back up again. You can't even close your browser. So you cancel, pops up, cancel, pops up, cancel, pops up, and you can't even close your browser unless you task kill it. Um, or you can turn that off and it does credential harvesting where it'll capture the username and password. Now what's interesting, I just want to show you something here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to target trusted set because that legally it's my company and everything. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, and I'm going to edit my config real quick and I'm going to turn the name of Java. So when you do a Java applet, you can make the name anything you want to. So when it pops up, it can be Microsoft or Google or whatever you want it to be. It's just purely configurable. So I'll make this trusted sec. Or you can make it trusted sec verified and secure. Because people believe everything that they read. And ignore my next command line here. Sorry. <laughs> my development box, okay, it's not like production. And I'm gonna go ahead and clone trust a second. What this is gonna do, it's gonna clone the entire website, grab it, rewrite it, put a bunch of bad stuff in it, do the injection techniques, the um, alphanumeric shellcode injection, recompile all the binaries, do encryption on top of that because AV vendors like really, so, any, sorry, any, any AV vendors in here real quick? <laughs> no offense, it's just, I've been building a lot of technology to circumvent that and putting a lot of encryption on top of it and virtualization, virtualization and sandboxing on top of everything and then encrypting it on top of that and then like base 64 encoding it 300 times on top of that and encrypting it on top of that. So there's like 3,000 methods that I use in this new version so that it doesn't get picked up. <laughs> so what it's doing, um, it's gonna go ahead, it's gonna take the binary it's going to uh, byte compile the binary. Um, it's going to randomize a cipher key exchange and encrypt it using 256AS. And then it's going to um, put some stuff on top of that and then it's going to encrypt it again. And then it's going to put some stuff on top of that and then encrypt it again. Okay? So you notice a little bit of delay when it actually runs. Um, and by the way, that initial PE file is a uh, virtualized PE, so it's all in a virtual machine. Um, but what you'll notice when I actually execute this, there's a little bit of delay from when I execute it to when it actually sends back because of all the encryption I put on top of it. So it takes a couple seconds for that to actually decrypt and do all the unobfuscation and everything on it. Um, so in here, we have everything running and ready to go. And we go to our website, and I just put a fake sales.trustedsec.com up. Okay, so I didn't put the fake trustedsec.com up, so I'm using an IP address. And it's gonna be a little slow because I'm on the internet. But you see here, I get the trusted sec website. It looks just you know, exactly the same as the website in every way, shape, or form. And what's going to happen is you're going to see a pop-up here in a second. And it says, you know, name trusted, verified, and secure. And notice the publisher. Um, so to get a code signing cert, apparently, I had to learn this the hard way. 
Um, you have to have an actual company to get a code sign certificate and to go through the whole GoDaddy process. So I spent 30 bucks and registered a company in the state of Ohio called Verified Publisher, and then I bought a code signing certificate. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and I actually changed it. Uh, I just did my articles of whatever and changed it to an S Corp so that it actually just shows up as Verified Publisher instead of LLC. It was kind of like a flag. But there's like cool names, you can, you can do anything. You can do like, this is trusted, please trust me, or whatever you want to do as a company, it doesn't make a difference. And then you just go buy a code sign certificate. You gotta, you gotta, you, you, I do have to admit, you have to throw up like a fake template website that has like your phone number on it and then say, hey, we're a real company, and then you get the code signing certificate. So it takes like, you know, like five or 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> so you have this, we trust it, right? Because we, we trust this certificate. And again, it doesn't matter if it's signed or not signed from a statistics perspective. So we trust this, and we hit run. And again, it's going to take a sec because it's doing its all decryption routines. And as soon as I hit run, by the way, what happens in the back end is it, it injects um, straight into memory, so we're never touching disk. Okay? Purely, um, purely native shell code jumping straight into memory, not touching disk. There it goes. Um, <laughs> and so what happens then, the second method, you'll notice two interpreter shells happening. Um, the first one, the PowerShell technique was successful, and then the second one, the binary dropper, was successful as well. So you can see both techniques were successful in deploying we have full access computer. And by the way, we are up to date and secure. <laughs> Yay. What is its uh, footprint in memory if you do a process down to <laughs> yeah, PowerShell, PowerShell, uh, the PowerShell process will be running, so you can dump everything in there. Um, what I do have is it automatically migrates off into Explorer, so you can migrate directly to Explorer, and you know you can still dump you know anything that's going on there. So from a memory perspective, you'll still be there. So. So that's doing a metaphorical reverse TCP back to your. Metaphorical reverse. You have the different payload solutions. You can do TCP, HTTP, HTTPS, all ports, whatever you want on that. It does it automatically uh, for you. And what it, what also happens um, that you don't see behind the scenes is. In order to execute something in PowerShell, um, PowerShell actually has restrictions that are called execution restriction policies. And um, execution restriction policies don't allow you to actually execute full applications. Well, at DEF CON 16, we came up with a technique to bypass that in a sense, um, to where you can basically take a program or application, you unicode the whole thing, you base 64 encode it, and you pass the encoded command parameters, and it allows you to circumvent the, encode, uh, the execution restriction policies and execute something unrestricted on the operating system. So you don't have to worry about uh, programs not being detected or not being executed on the system itself. So different techniques that you can use uh, to jump into memory without having to worry about those protection mechanisms. Dave, is that how you also bypass UAC? UAC is different. Um, so UAC is a whole other uh, ballgame. So two years ago, um, one of my friends, Kevin Mitnick, was doing a pen test. And he um, calls me up and he's like, hey, I can't figure out a way to um, bypass UAC. Do you know any methods? I'm like, well, I really haven't looked at it before, so I'll take a look. And like three hours later, we had our way around it. And what happens is when you log into um, your Windows machine, um, you're, you're basically you spawn multiple threads and different processes running as different user accounts, okay? So when you log into your machine, you have Explorer and DC that's running under the context of your user account. So for example, Dave. Um, when you're running as Dave, um, Explorer and DC does a number of interactions that require administrative level rights, but it never trips UAC. And that's why I started tipping me off. I'm like, why is that? So I started looking at how Explorer and DC worked, and what happens is all of the um, executables within Microsoft are signed by what are called trusted publisher certificates. And those certificates basically whitelist that process from being UAC safe. And so what you can do is you can actually in inject into explorer.exe and call a DL an imported DLL function that then spawns another command shell under the context of that uh, process that's UAC safe. So you can bypass UAC and it still works today. So you can still bypass UAC uh, today and that's actually a post-exploitation module in uh, Terminal. Maybe you notice what happened after I hit run. Um, I redirected back to the legitimate website, so the victim never knew that they're at a bad spot in the first place. So it's more believable. So I'm like, wait.